If you have ever looked into the most powerful 484 locomotives ever built, you are going to end up at the Norfolk and Western J-Class every single time. They were 14 locomotives that rolled out of the Roanoke shops between 1941 and 1950, all built by Norfolk and Western's own people. No outside builders, just the men and women who knew exactly what they were doing. These locomotives had 80,000 pounds of tractive effort, the most powerful 484 ever built, and that power came from a combination of 300 pounds per square inch boiler pressure and those 70-inch drivers that were too small for what they were planned to do with them. When you build a locomotive that needs to hit 110 miles per hour, you normally put bigger drivers underneath, but Norfolk and Western had a problem. They had to run through the Appalachians, through West Virginia and Virginia on steep mountain grades, and you need tractive effort for that, not just speed. So they went with smaller drivers, built the wheelbase stiff, used lightweight rods, and balanced it so precisely that they could theoretically hit 140 miles per hour. The downside of all that precision engineering was that these locomotives were sensitive to poor track, and with that high center of gravity, they did not have much room for error on curves. The first five, number 600 through 604, came out in 1941 and early 1942. They were streamlined with a bullet nose and Tuscan red stripes. Then the war came and material restrictions meant six more were built without streamlining. Numbers 605 through 610 rolled out as J1 class without the skirts. Later, in the mid-1940s, they received shrouding and were folded into the regular J class. The last three, numbers 611 through 613, came out in summer 1950, and they were the last mainline steam passenger locomotives ever built in America. They pulled the big trains, the Powhatan Arrow from Norfolk to Cincinnati, the Pocahontas, and the Cavalier. They could run 15,000 miles per month. Now, here's where things get dark, because for a class of 14 locomotives, four of them ended up in serious wrecks between 1946 and 1956, and three of those had the same theme. Excessive speed in territory, where there was no margin for error. On June 12, 1946, Locomotive 604 was pulling the eastbound Powhatan Arrow, and at 3.18 in the afternoon, it hit a curve four miles west of Powhatan, West Virginia, doing 55 miles per hour. The speed limit was 35, and the Interstate Commerce Commission calculated the overturning speed at 56, which means they were right at the edge. The locomotive flipped to the outside of the curve without marking the rails. It went over on its side and slid 373 feet with the tender still attached. Both crew members were killed, the engineer and the fireman, and 27 people were injured. The Interstate Commerce Commission blamed it on excessive speed. Case closed. Two years later, on February 20, 1948, it happened again. Locomotive 607 was hauling the Powhatan Arrow near Franklin Furnace, Ohio, and this time the crew failed to obey an automatic block signal and entered a turnout at 77 miles per hour when they should have been crawling. The fireman was killed in that wreck. Same story, excessive speed. These locomotives were built to go fast. They could do 110 miles per hour on flat straight track, as they proved when 610 was loaned to the Pennsylvania Railroad in late 1944 and ran between Chicago and Crestline at those speeds. The Pennsylvania Railroad inspector said it rode smoother than any of their own locomotives, except for that weird 6446 S1. October 30, 1953, Locomotive 613 was pulling Train 45, the Tennessean, northeast of Bristol at Wallace, Virginia, and it rear-ended a local freight train. 56 people were injured in that collision, and the investigation blamed the passenger train for failing to heed warning signals. Then came January 22, 1956, and this is the big one. Locomotive 611 left Bluefield, West Virginia at 10.34 in the evening with the westbound Pocahontas No. 3, already running 14 minutes late. The train stopped at Welch to pick up mail and got even later, and by the time it was approaching Cedar along the Tug Fork River, engineer Walter B. Willard was trying to make up lost time. That stretch of the Pocahontas division was slow, twisting mountain railroad with low speed limits, but 611 was doing over 50 miles per hour. 
At 12.51 in the morning on January 23, 1956, it hit a curve, and that high center of gravity did exactly what everyone should have known would happen. The locomotive flipped onto its left side, slid down the embankment toward the river, and the tender turned completely upside down. Willard did not make it, and 60 people were injured. The damage estimate came to $141,000 total. This was the last major wreck of a steam-powered revenue passenger train in the United States. Most railroads would have scrapped a locomotive after a wreck like that, but N&W rebuilt it in less than a month. Four major wrecks, four crew members lost, over 140 people injured, with excessive speed at the heart of three of them and a blown signal in the fourth. The ICC investigations pointed out that human error in speed management was the primary cause, but they also noted that the locomotive's relatively high center of gravity increased the risk of overturning on curves in mountainous terrain. By 1958, Norfolk and Western's new president Stuart Saunders was done with steam. He started buying diesels and ordered 268 GP9s, and the J-Class got reassigned to freight service. By January 1959, several of her sisters were lined up at Bluefield waiting to get scrapped, and 611 was parked right in front of that deadline. But there was a lawyer from Roanoke named Graham Clater, a massive rail fan, and he started writing letters begging Saunders to save just one. Norfolk and Western picked 611 specifically because it was in excellent condition after that 1956 rebuild. Clater got his wish. 611 pulled three final excursions in late 1959, and on October 24th, it hauled the Rail Museum Safari with 450 railway enthusiasts from 25 states. Saunders donated it to Roanoke, Clater put up $500 for upkeep, and in 1963, it went on display at the Roanoke Transportation Museum where it sat for almost 20 years. And here is where it gets incredible, because Graham's brother Robert Clater worked his way up to president of Norfolk and Western as it merged with Southern Railway to become Norfolk Southern. In 1981, Robert leased 611 from the museum and sent it to Birmingham for a complete overhaul. When it came back in 1982, he said something that still hits me. Nothing I have done has given me more pleasure since coming to the railroad than taking 611 out of its tomb at the Transportation Museum. For 12 years, from 1982 to 1994, Locomotive 611 ran excursions all over Norfolk Southern. In 1984, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers named it a National Historic Mechanical Engineering Landmark. Then the program ended, and it went back to the museum now called the Virginia Museum of Transportation, where it sat for 21 years. In 2013, the museum launched Fire Up 611. Nearly 3,000 donors from the United States and 18 foreign countries raised $3.5 million. They brought 611 back for Norfolk Southern's 21st Century STEAM program. It ran in 2015, 2016, and 2017. In 2017, Virginia named it the official state steam locomotive of Virginia. Today, it's the only survivor out of 14. It still runs occasionally on heritage railways, and it still blows that Hancock three-chime whistle. Four crew members lost their lives, and over 140 people were injured in wrecks where engineering perfection turned into a liability when crews pushed past the limits. But 611 survived the wrecks, survived the scrap line twice, survived 21 years sitting silent, and came back because people cared enough to make it happen.